Uh, Mark Schlereth now joining us live. Uh, and, you know, Elway came onto the scene, and he had some struggles in the playoffs, mostly because he didn't have a run game. But Mahomes was different. He didn't have a winning record in college. But you see him twice a year, right, with the Broncos. Did you know, I mean, let's forget the first year because we didn't see him. How quickly in year two, Mark, having played with a great quarterback, did you identify, man, this looks different. <laughs> we maybe did it. T- yeah. Did it take a while that you were like, that's like beyond just like good. Right. No, it was right off the bat. As soon as he started to play, you saw exceptional talent, you know, and I think the thing that mesmerizes us as football fans is we see the off schedule stuff that he does, his scrambling around, his ability to be accurate, back across the football field, switch it to his left hand and throw to completion and all those things. And that's what we tend to focus on, the no-look passes, right? And that's what we tend to focus on as football fans. But really, to me, what set him apart as a young player is his ability to throw it and eviscerate you from the pocket and manipulate safeties, manipulate coverage by eyeballing one guy, throwing it in a different direction. That's what blew me away about his, you know, it was his second year, but really the first year that he played was his ability to be efficient and just absolutely cut you up from the pocket. And I thought that's what set him apart. And then all the other stuff was just gravy. I have this thing I call the 70-30 rule. 70% of the time, I want to be on schedule. As an offense, I want to be on schedule. 30% of the time, when things break down, which they do because you're going to miss a protection, you're going to bust a protection, you know, you're not going to pick up a blitz or whatever the case may be, I want my guy to be able to make a big play outside the pocket, on the run, scrambling around, off schedule. And he's got those both things. I mean, those things are are like he is great from the pocket, great when he's moving around, and his ability to create off platform. He's just he's just special. He's just fun to watch. So you were in a lot of big games with John. You won some. You lost uh, some as well. I thought, you know, you can usually pinpoint why a team loses. And I don't like the word luck because I think your choices in life will determine mm-hmm. your success. But I do think in individual moments, games, days, you know, you can get T-boned in your car, wrong place, wrong time, bad luck, right? now. And I did think San Francisco, some of this loss was – Bad luck. Dre Greenlaw gets injured running on the field. Sure. Kansas City fumbles five times, recovers four of them. I did think this game was like fairly blameless. I thought Brock Purdy was good enough to win. I I, I felt like the Niners yeah. got luck against the Lions on that face mask interception, and they got no luck against Kansas City. And I hate the word, but you've been in these big games. Some of it's just randomness, is it not? Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think some of it is that. You know, my dad used to tell me all the time, luck has the smell of perspiration. Um, and you know, I've always I've always adhered to that. I think from a confidence standpoint and your belief as a football team that in critical moments we're gonna make critical plays. We're gonna make the big plays in critical moments. And that comes from confidence, and that comes from confidence on both sides of the ball, especially when you know you have 15 back there. If we just get our offense the ball back, 15 will walk you off. Patrick Mahomes is going to take care of it. So there's there's some of that aspect. You know, that whole thing of, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Luck has a smell of perspiration. You know, I look at the third quarter, and you get the ball twice. First off, you kick off to them. They fumble on the pitch out uh, to Isaiah Pacheco. They recover that. Then on third down, they throw an interception. And you go three and out in the next series, you go three and out again. And I heard them ask Kyle Shanahan in the postgame press conference, like, hey, you didn't establish the run in the third quarter. And he said, it's really hard to establish the run when you go three and out, three and out. I'll tell you when it's even harder to establish the run is when you don't run the ball. You threw it six straight times. Like, that's not establishing the run. So some of that luck right there, you can create your own luck with the way you manage a game and the way you think about what's best. I think one of the things that always frustrated me as a player was we would be rolling with a certain scheme or a certain play, and eventually the coaches feel like, oh, they're going to adjust to this. They're going to get us on this. And I've always believed in identity. I've always believed in I'm better than you, and I know I'm better than you, and so I don't care if you know what we're doing. We're still going to shove it down your throat. 
And you get away from that sometimes as a coach because you feel like it's just a matter of time before Steve Spagnola adjusts to what we're doing. And, and I'm not a believer in that. I'm a believer in just continuing to push the pace, continuing to do what you do well, continuing to believe in my guys can overcome and execute the plays that we know how to run best. And I thought you got away from that a little bit in the third quarter. And I thought that that's one of the things that cost you this game. So um, you're very meticulous uh, for people that don't know. Mark has a personal relationship with every blade of grass in his front yard. Okay. Yes. So you are. That's true. That's true. I, I am not. So my take on the overtime rules is that Andy and Kyle had talked to their analytic people and they knew what they were going to do. That players don't know as much as you think. And I always say this, if, if I got a flood in my basement, I'd turn to my wife and go, are we covered? That the guy running the orchestra can't play the clarinet. I don't know everything in my 401k. I have somebody I pay to figure it out. And that I don't need the players to know everything. Defensive guys tackle, offensive guys block, catch, don't fumble. I'm okay with a little bit of on-the-fly teaching overtime saying, guys, okay, if we do score, they can score. You tell guys on the sideline. But a lot of people push back on me and think this is do, you, you, that's not due diligence. Kyle Shanahan wasn't prepared. Mm -hmm. As somebody that is meticulous, your blocking angles, the way I, I know your personality a little, did it bother you that San Francisco, some players are like, yeah, we didn't really know what was going on? Yeah, I think that always bothers you because I think, you know, mentally, you, you're always trying to prepare for everything that you can prepare for. And, you know, that's part of the process. The fact that Kansas City, you know, and their players said, we knew exactly what our plan was. You didn't actually necessarily have a plan with your players. You did as a coaching staff, but not with your players. But, you know, here's the biggest thing that, that I get into, and I get into arguments with this all the time, whether it's radio or social media, about analytics. Like analytics, I hate math. I hate the math nerds that, that infiltrate the game. And, you know, the reason I hate it is because math has never made one tackle. Not, math has never thrown a block. And, and math has not ever had to defend Patrick Mahomes. And so, you know, accepting the ball after you win the kickoff and not deferring might be great if you're playing, I don't know, you know, whoever. Name a quarterback. But if you give Patrick Mahomes an opportunity to walk you off, I'm sorry, that's a bad idea. <laughs> the other thing that I thought, right, the other thing that I thought um, during the course of that is it doesn't matter if you accept the ball, if they kick it off and you muff it and you have to pick up the ball on the two-yard line, you get tackled. You're in four-down territory from your own two in overtime when the second possession happens. Yeah. So you're giving Patrick Mahomes four downs every single time. And I just think that from an analytics standpoint, I get the use of analytics, but sometimes, you know what? We can't block your three technique. Sometimes Chris Jones dominates the game and then analytics goes out the window. I've got to call the game based upon the game that I'm playing right now. I always say this from a broadcasting standpoint, when I'm in the booth for Fox, you can't call the game that you thought was going to happen. You have to call the game <laughs> that's sitting in front of you. Yeah. And you know what? And, and that's, that's a, that's a hard thing to do when you've prepared, you've studied so much like I do every single week. That's hard to do. when all of a sudden everything you thought was going to happen doesn't happen. And now I've got to call the game based upon the game that's sitting in front of me. And I thought that's where Kyle Shanahan made a mistake. But listen, the, the narrative of, of Kyle Shanahan can't win the big one. Give me a break. Yeah. This guy is one of the greatest coaches in the national football league. And, you know, when he was an offensive coordinator in Atlanta, he went up and lost to Tom Brady. Now he's lost two Super Bowls as the head coach of San Francisco, both of them to freaking Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. I'm sorry. You know what? Most people are going to lose to that guy. Yeah. Finally, there's a new documentary, Apple TV, The Dynasty on uh, New England. And like the MJ documentary, even though we know a lot of the stories, it is kind of fascinating when you deep dive. And that's why I think you and I probably both love a good documentary. They're fun. Even so, even if they did one on Elway, you'd probably find out stuff you didn't know. Mm -hmm. And it's fun to watch the storytelling of it. But it, it's interesting because Elway didn't get along with everybody. Uh, he had an, he had a point of view and he and Dan Reeves could scuffle. Our, uh, reportedly, Brady and Belichick was brutal at the end. They called it a hostile work environment. 
Um, having lived through the Elway stuff, are you surprised by it, or are there relationships, even with winning teams, Mark? It's, it, there's a lot more dirty laundry than the average guy like me thinks. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's, there are times. We went through we went through an end of the season with my offensive line coach, Alex Gibbs, where we did not speak. The whole offensive line did not speak to him for three weeks. <laughs> we actually taped off the locker room. So when the coaches had to walk through the locker room, he was not allowed. It was a no Alex Gibbs zone. And he couldn't walk through that section of the locker room. He had to go around or outside. We wouldn't let him through. Like, like yeah, there are some, there are some moments where you really get pissed at one another. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of, that's part of it. it that it happens. Um, I love Alex Gibbs with my whole heart. He is the the best, you know, the best individual coach I ever coached or ever played for. And, and I played for three hall of famers and Jim Hannafin, Joe Bugle and Alex Gibbs. And I was blessed to be able to do it, but there were times <laughs> where he really pissed me off. <laughs> and, and you know what? Um, I always, I always tell this story, Colin, that, Alex Gibbs is yelling at me for something. I come to the sideline. He is just dog cussing me up one side and down the other. And he's completely wrong about what he thought he saw. And I'm like, I'm out there. You're not out there. You don't know what you're talking about. Get out of my face. And on and on. We went back and forth for a solid, you know, two minutes. And finally, I had my helmet in my hand, right? One of those helmets that's sitting up there on the top. I don't know if you can see it, but I had my helmet in my hand. And he just wouldn't shut up. And finally, I just took that helmet and I tried to break his sternum with it. I hit him right in the chest, knocked all the air out of him. And I just go, if you think you can block him, be my guest. If you can't get the blank out of my face. Wow. And then he, you know, he watered off and, 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 you know, the rest is history. I was right. He was wrong. He didn't apologize. Cause that's not what he did, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, that's just the way it goes sometimes. And finally love that story. 12th pick first round Denver. Lot of people are talking about a quarterback it is what I would do if I was Denver and I was going to move off Russell. If you're not, then don't. What's the vibe in Denver on that number 12 pick? That's good. That's a good enough pick to get probably the third mm -hmm. or fourth best quarterback. You could also move up uh, four or five spots and not have to, you know, give up your future. What do you think Denver does with that pick? Yeah, really interesting. Um, I think I know Sean well enough, you know Sean well enough to know he's not going to reach for a quarterback. It's like, hey, there's six of them, just take one. That's garbage. That's not how it works. You've got to be in love with a guy and not, not talk yourself into being in love with a guy, but actually studying it and preparing and, and talking about it really, and, you know, really diving deep into it, really fall in love with a guy's skill set and what that guy provides. And so – one thing about Sean, you can talk to a lot of different people about Sean Payton, um, but he he has been right a lot more than he's been wrong when it comes to the draft and what he thinks a guy is. And you can go through his draft picks from go back to that 2017 draft with Lattimore and with, you know, and with uh, Ramchek and with uh, uh, Alvin Kamara, you know, I mean. Like he's, he's done a great job with that stuff. So he will have to be absolutely in love with a guy to take him to 12, but I could also see him moving back. If he can find a dance partner and saying, Hey man, I'm going to accumulate another, maybe a second rounder and still get my quarterback where I want to get him. But it'll be somebody that he's absolutely in love with and can't live without. That'll be the direction he goes. Hi everybody. It's me, uncle Colin subscribe here to get the latest from the herd, including exclusive behind-the-scenes videos and more wherever you may be, however you may be watching. Thanks again for making us part of your day.